It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And if you're like me, you like to write down the scripture. Maybe you can go back and read it before you go to your small group and discuss this this week. The scripture is going to be Matthew 5, verse 43 through 48. And if you're like me, you need some time to get there, right, to, to flip there. So I'm going to give you that time. Me, I've got to go to the table of contents. I've got to find the table of contents. Between all the maps and the accreditations and everything else and a thank you page that has my name on it, it's just getting in my way at this point, you know, whoever gave me the Bible. All right, got to get through all that. So you're at the table of contents. Find Matthew and go to chapter 5. And while you're doing that, let me set this up. I've already given this sermon, so I'm not too nervous. And I don't just mean first period. Uh, first period. I'm, I'm a teacher, yeah. First period, I already had this. Do your bell work and we'll, yeah. So I, for those who don't know, I am a, a high school teacher. But I've already given this message to my students. And uh, I've unashamedly admit that I preach to my students. I do. I preach to them in the classroom, and I'm sure if my administrators are watching this, they're like, uh, what? We need to see about that, right? Uh, But I call them real talks. Every Friday, we have a real talk, and there's a quote that we use in that real talk, and if they're here today, they'll probably start mouthing it as I say it, but it's that your past will sink into your present and start affecting your future. Isn't that a true statement? That's an Andy Stanley statement, right? So you know it's true, and you know it's anointed. But I say that every Friday, And I give these real talks, I give these little sermonettes, I just don't quote or say where I got my quotes. I don't cite my sources, what I'm saying. So I'll give a message, and I just won't cite my sources, right? I'll say, hey, this real talk's on anger. Uh, You guys don't get angry so quickly. To which you would say, be slow to anger? Yeah, I didn't say that, though, right? I, I didn't say that there's a friend of mine named Mark who wrote me a letter long ago and and told me that, you know, we really should not get angry so quickly. I'm not going to say all of that. I'm not going to say that no war- weapon formed against me shall, you know, I won't say it that way, but I will give some advice to my students. And so I've already given this message, and I gave it to them last week, and so you're going to get uh, that same message, and it's going to be like you're in class with me. So welcome to school. Welcome to school. I want you to write down a couple of things, though. This is all or nothing. That's the name of the message. A couple of things I want you to write down. First, thing I want you to think of during this entire message is, what am I communicating, as in you? So write down, what am I communicating? Because I'm not the only communicator in the room. Every time you encounter someone, every time that you're in the presence of someone, you're communicating something. They're seeing something in you, they're seeing something through you, so you're communicating some message to someone. So what are you communicating? The next thing I want you to write down is this, we show who Jesus is to us when we show love to everyone. We show who Jesus is to us when we show love to everyone. Everyone, everyone. Even though, yeah, even them. And we'll talk about that. And I know that you have a lot of notes that you're already writing down. You've already run out of ink at this point. But the last thing I want you to write down, and this is the main, and I'm doing this just in case at some point you drift off because I'm going to bring a little a little gadget on stage, and that might, might just draw all your attention, so I may miss you with this. So I want to make sure you get it early. Here's the final thing I want you to write down. We can't be responsible for keeping people out of church. We cannot, as Christians, now this is just for Christians. If you're not a Christian, you're not a Christ follower, you don't know if you buy into the whole Jesus thing, this message is not for you today. You just get to sit back, relax, and I'm going to load you up with some ammo to use against Christians that you work with or Christians that you know, or a Christian that you're dating who drug you here because they promised food afterward. I'm just going to load you up so you can look at them and go, oh, really, you're supposed to be doing... Shame, shame. I'm going to load you up with some stuff. But if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, if you love Jesus, sanctified and delivered, however you want to word it, then you cannot be the reason. You cannot be the source. You cannot be a person who is keeping people away from church. You should not be that person. And those are all the things I want you to write down. And so if you're still trying to write that down, let me give you a little bit of uh, time. I'll slow sit for my shameless plug right here. Squad meets today, our youth student organization. So if you are watching online, but you're in the area, come join us. Students, qualified, unified, active, and delivered, right? But driven is how we like to say it. And they're just arriving inside the guardrails that God gives them. Amen. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if you didn't know what our logo was for, those are guardrails, and that's our students trying to get where God wants them to be. So they arrive the way they want to be there. Amen. Praise God for marketing. All right. 
You should have everything written down you need. Let's jump into the word. We're in Matthew chapter 5 because Jesus says a lot better than I do. So I just want to piggyback off of exactly what he said. A little construct here. Jesus is giving a sermon, and his is a long sermon. By long, I mean that he goes through chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. So you are going to get out of here much earlier than the original audience who heard this message. So be thankful for that. But chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus starts with a particular expression. He says, you have heard that it was said. You have heard that it was said, implying that this is common knowledge, meaning that this has happened before, that society has accepted this and this is okay. The funny thing is this is the sixth time Jesus says that. When he talks about murder, he starts off with that expression. When he talks about adultery, he starts off with that. Divorce, oats, eye for an eye, and then he gets here for love your enemies and says, you have heard that it was said. It's an old expression, it's common knowledge, and society says it's okay. But how many people know that what society says is okay isn't necessarily okay? Because society used to say, hey, smoke if you got them, right? Yeah, yeah, light up a cigarette. You saw cartoons with smoking in it. You saw a camel who was a cartoon smoking and it looking pretty cool in his leather jacket, if I have to say so myself. But now you can't find a commercial online. And used to, whenever you got to a, online, you can't find them online, my fault. You can't find them on TV. See, you can tell that we're smart TV. We're all digital now. But you can't see a commercial on TV anymore on smoking and cigarettes. And you used to go to a restaurant. They would say, uh, would you like uh, smoking or non-smoking? But now, you're lucky if you can light up a cigarette within 100 feet of a building because, oh gosh, society used to say it's okay, and now they're saying, well, there's a cancer thing you should probably be aware of, right? So just because society says it's okay doesn't mean it's okay. And so Jesus steps up, and in this, he's saying, hey, y'all have heard this, and I'm here to say it's not okay. He says, you have heard that it is said, love your neighbor, easy, and hate your enemy, already done, Right? So if you're a Duke fan, absolutely hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them. They just need to go hang out with wherever it is that that person they like to root for, he resides. I believe it's the devil, right? So they should all go, yeah. You can't just hate. Absolutely. We have chapel in our name, I'm just saying. All right, chapel heal. We, I mean, anointed, right? But you can't just hate your enemies, I'm going to get a bunch of messages about Duke, right? Yeah, absolutely. He says, you can't just hate your enemies, but I tell you, meaning something new right here. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's hard. Josh, that's difficult, yeah. But when Jesus gave this, here's how it probably went. So love your enemies. A bunch of hands went up. Uh, Yes, you in the back. Um, Even the Samaritans, even the Samaritans. Then maybe Matthew, a tax collector, raised his hand. Yes, Matthew. Even the women, Matthew. Yeah. Goodness, Matthew. Yes, even the women. What is with you? And it, what, about, what about the people who don't speak the same language? Even the people who don't speak the same language. Guys, everyone, your enemies, anyone who persecutes you, anyone who ridicules you, anyone who decides that they want to insult you because of your belief, them too. Anyone who wants to call you out and acknowledge where you've messed up, yep, them too. And here's why you should. And here's the perfect example because the guy who said this, Jesus, hung on a cross. He was nailed to that cross by individuals. Those guys who nailed him to the cross then backed away, and as he's hanging up there, they threw insults at him. They caused him pain. They caused him hurt. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus looked up and said, Father, forgive them in the midst of what they were doing, not after they did it, not after he could find it within himself to say, oh, it's okay, it doesn't hurt anymore, it doesn't hurt anymore, it's going to be over soon. Not even then. It was right as it happened. Usually when someone hurls insults at me, you want to think just like I do, Lord, they know exactly what they're saying. They know exactly what they're doing. You need to get them right now. That's your prayer, right? Oh, I pray for them, Josh. Yeah, you need to right now, let their car fall apart. I pray that they run out of gas, that old country song, right? I have prayed that a flower falls off and yeah, all this. That's not what Jesus is saying. And said he prayed for forgiveness. And we're getting to my favorite part of this scripture. So he says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And he says that you may be children of your father in heaven. And that messes with me. Children of your father in heaven. If you're a parent, this starts to make sense because you've been in a car, bless your soul, it's probably this morning, and in the back seat, your children decided to hurl insults at each other and probably some Cheerios and other food as well. 
but they're going at it in the back seat, arguing, fussing, and you do the whole, don't make me pull over. You're going down 995. I don't think you want to pull over, right? Hopefully they're in Kids Point, didn't hear that. But you're hearing all of these things, and you know what you're thinking? How could you say that to someone who has the same blood as you? How could you say that to someone who is your relative, your blood relative? And you know why you're saying that? Because it's your blood that's in their veins. Jesus is saying you need to love your enemies because the same blood that saved you saved them. The same blood. We are all blood relatives. I can't hurl insults at Marissa because we are blood relatives relatives. We're actually related. This is my, my wife, but we are blood relatives, not in the Kentucky kind of way. We're not, but we are blood. We are blood relatives. All right. And so we shouldn't insult each other. We should love one another because we're both children of God. We're washed by the same blood. He hung on that cross for you. He hung on that cross for me. So how can I possibly attack you to bring you down as though you're one of my enemies? And so he's saying, it's like you're my children because I was there for you and I need you to not do that to someone I care about. Andy Stanley said it like this. He said that uh, he gave this uh, similar message uh, at Drive Conference, which is amazing. And uh, yes, amen, Brother G. And he had his two of his uh, children on the front row. And he said, if you insult my children, if you insult my children, you do not need to take me out to dinner. You do not need to call me up and say, hey, I would love to really treat you and your wife out for a meal. You don't need to give him a gift card to make up for it. You don't need to do any of these things to try to be buddy-buddy. And he mentioned this. He said, if you insult my children, you don't need to praise my name on high. You don't need to come once a week and pretend it's okay and then turn around Monday and do it all over again. Jesus is saying that, that. He's saying, that's my child you're talking to. You can't insult one of my children and then turn around and try to act like everything's okay with me because I'm upset about that because that was one of my children. It's the same blood. But Jesus, in his awesomeness, does not stop there. Instead, he keeps going. And he says that those are my children, sorry, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And he says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now that messes with me still. Doesn't it with you, Tabitha? It it, it makes no sense. How how is it that I'm the good one and those over there, they're the bad ones? You know, me and you, we're we're the children like I just mentioned. You know, know, blessed and delivered. We we, we own it. But but them, I can understand that the sun's going to rise for you and me because we're right. We're good. We're smart. Except for that whole... Duke thing. You know, we, we got that going on. And the sun's going to rise. For, but he says that the sun rises for them too. I can understand that the rain's going to fall on you and me. But it's going to fall on them too. It, it, it messes with me because no one, here, here's why, it, and I hope you, you understand this. No one wakes up in the morning wanting to be wrong. Hear me out. I, I don't believe that you get up in the morning And as you get into your car, you think to yourself, I would love to take this vehicle and run it into another vehicle and then take our vehicles off to the side and have a discussion. That would be the perfect day for me, right? I don't think anyone does that. Nonetheless, you're at an intersection. Someone takes their vehicle, runs it into you. You pull off to the side and in your mind, you think, how dare you? You must have done this on purpose, right? And you think that they are so wrong and they are so bad and they are so unintelligent we're not going to call them you know we're not going to say what we really want to say but they're not so smart we'll say that the same thing with your spouse anytime you've been in an argument there's a right side and there's a wrong side and for you you've always been on the right side right you're right they're wrong you're smart they're don't not so smart you're good and they're bad Ironically, on the other side of that argument, they're right and you're wrong. They're good and you're bad. They're the smart ones and you're the not so smart one. That's how that works out, hence the argument. So if we don't intend to be that every day, how is it possibly that we end up being that almost every day? And that is why a lot of people say, I don't believe in a God because there's bad in the world. There's bad in the world because we're in the world, not because God's not in the world. 
He came down to try to fix it, and we still mess it up. It's amazing, really. But the fact that the sun would still rise over someone like me, someone who doesn't deserve it, the fact that there's a sun, I'm not talking about a ball in the sky anymore, that there's a sun who would be pierced for me, that there's a sun who would wake up and say, something is wrong, I need to fix it, that there's a sun who would bleed out for me, who would suffocate for me, who would die for me, and in three days that sun would rise up and say, you know what, I got this. I will fix this. I will pour out my love for you. And I want to acknowledge somehow that that son wasn't for anyone else other than me. How can I deny love to someone else when I needed it the most? How is it that during a worship song I can say, oh, God, thank you for grace. Thank you for love because it means so much to me. And I was unworthy and unwilling. I did not deserve it. Thank you for it. And then turn around and say, oh, I'm not going to give it to you, though. How is that possible? The reason that, one of the reasons, I was already going to give this message and it just happened to work out. Again, one of those Christian coincidences. But a student asked me or said this to me uh, early in the week. Uh, She said, Coach Carter, you're one of the nicest Christians I've ever met. And I said, I'm so sorry. And now I I had to go back and say, "Well, well, thank you for saying that, but isn't that bad? That I could be acknowledged as saying, you're one of the nicest I've ever met. If, if we were doing what we need to do, Christian, now if you're not a Christian or a Christ follower, you're, you're just relax and, and sit back. But if you're a Christian, it should be that, man, you Christians are so nice. You know, you're just so kind. I, I don't know if I believe in every single detail that you believe in. You know, I, I, I want to know more, read more about the resurrection and all that. But, man, I really hope I marry one of you guys one day. Man, you know, I'm an employer and the whole Jesus thing, I don't know yet. But, man, you Christians are so nice. I really want to hire a bunch of you guys to run my business because you're so honest. You're so nice. You're so welcoming. But instead, a student tells me, you're one of the nicest. Now, she mentioned their family in that, too, and said, you know, you're, they're, they're good. But, but, like, you're one of the extra, like, nice people. Not everyone's like that. And I don't mean that to brag, but I'm saying that we should all be singled out and said, that must be a Christian. That, that must be a Christ follower. That's weird that they would respond that way. And that's why in your mind, when you hear this, you're thinking, love my enemies. That's weird. Yes, we've got to, like Micah said, raise the bar and keep raising the bar. But Jesus had more to say. He said, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he says in verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? If you love those who already like you, what has changed? So if I already have a group over here who's just like me and that's all I hang out with, that's all who I talk to, nothing can change, nothing can grow. Jesus was all about growth. He was all about fruit. And he made a lot of analogies with gardens and trees because if I'm doing the right thing, something is going to grow from it. If I say, you know, I think you guys understand it, that group over there, I want to go talk to them. And it's a group that I've never really talked to Now we can grow, and now that group can go over with this group, and our group starts to grow. It starts to flourish. But if I hang out with the same ones, and I'm not saying don't have friends, I'm saying that I can't continuously separate myself from people who are not like me. Because he says nothing's going to happen right there. And so I need you to write this down. If you want world change, separate yourselves. Don't complain about, man, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's as bad as it's ever been, which there's some things throughout our history, if you, if you read that are pretty bad. Don't complain about it. Separate yourself to change and do something about it. Don't just talk about the problem, right? Anytime something happens in the house, here's my response. I get one second to go, man, and then I'm up and I've got to go fix it. I can't spill something in the kitchen and then say, man, there is a spill on the floor. That is terrible. This kitchen is as dirty as it's ever been, right? This kitchen is going to hell in a handbasket with gasoline. I can't just say that. I need to go get a towel. I need to bend down. I need to put it into action. So if you want change, separate yourselves. Separate yourselves. And Jesus says, if you love each other, sorry, if you love those who love you, 
what reward will you get? And then he picks out Matthew. He picks on Matthew. This is pretty, this is pretty funny. You know they must have been close. He says, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And to which Matthew said, thanks, Jesus. I appreciate it. All right? Are not even the tax collectors? He raised his hand. Early, aren't even the tax collectors doing that? To which Matthew said, yeah, we kind of do all hang out together because no one else likes us. But he goes on. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. How can you complain about a group of people of non-believers who are doing what non-believers do? If you, as a believer, as a Christian, as someone who loves other people, are not extending any love in their direction, of course they're going to do what they're going to do. Just like you're going to do what you want to do unless you separate yourselves. So we have to separate ourselves because we've been separated by God. He did this for us. So don't even the pagans do that. And last verse from this part of Jesus's sermon, be perfect. And I'm glad that's not a period after that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And so that is not the part that I told my students. They didn't get all that. That that was just for you. That was just for you. But here's the part that they did get. I told them this. I said that we're all individuals, right? We're all individuals. And when you wake up in the morning, as an individual, it would be a perfect day. It would be an awesome day. If all of the intersections between your house and your job would be green, praise God, right? If everyone could get on your same page, if all of your family could get on, your parents, if all of your children could get on your same sleep schedule, oh my God, glory be to him in heaven, right? If only everyone around you could get on the same page as you, your life would be so much better, amen, right? You, you can agree to that. Even the non-Christians are like, yeah, that's true. Is that in the Bible somewhere? That, that, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I could use that. I could use some of that, right? So put the word up for me real quick. Uh, This word I want to talk about, I just want to talk about us, right, as individuals. I want to put the word individual up and just examine that term real quick. As an individual, it's a beautiful word, right? You as an individual, aren't you pretty? You're you're big, you're all capitals, right? You you, you look good up there. You You look great. But here's the funny thing about the word individual. It has three eyes in it. Isn't that a cool trick? Don't you wish you could do that? Like if you could just walk around with your, your children and say, here's why you're not getting a puppy. All right, point one, right? And just have a screen right there with you. But individual has three eyes in it, just like you as an individual. So each eye is the same length. It's the same width. It's the same color. Now here's the thing that gets us caught up. Just like you and me as people, there's a little bit of a difference between us, right? Like for the first eye and the second eye, there's like two, two things that kind of separate us that we don't see eye to eye on. Okay, pun intended, right? All right, we, we don't quite see eye to eye. But the second eye and the third eye, there's a, there's a little bit of a difference, uh, but we still not quite see. But, you know, we can still agree on a lot of things, though. So we don't see eye to eye on what's in between us, but we still have the same level, the same understanding. We're still people. Now, check this out. If we take the eyes out, that's no longer a word. You have individual, right? You have no word, but you do have dual at the end, if that's something you can be proud of. But we have no word if we take us out. So here's my point. We are all individuals with individual needs. Let me paint this picture for you. I'm going to ask you three questions, and I just want you to answer rhetorically, all right? First question is this. What if I gave you what you want? What if I gave you what you want? And this happened so wonderfully before the first service. I didn't even set this up. It was was pretty cool. I'll explain it after the second question. But what if I gave you what you wanted? Like if you wanted a cup of coffee and I found out that you wanted a cup of coffee, I could see, you know, when you came in that you needed a cup of coffee. Coffee saves lives, contrary to other belief. It does in my classroom anyway. All right. If, if you needed coffee and I found out you needed coffee, what if I gave you what you wanted? You would be happy. You would be a happy individual, right? Question number two. What if I gave you what I wanted? What if, what if I wanted coffee and I took the $4 and instead of buying me coffee, I bought you a coffee? 
Well, Josh, that would be uh, pretty profound, I guess, in a theological uh, perspective, but uh, I still think that that would be uh, no, uh, no nonsense gibberish. Uh, it's just it's poppycock. Now, now you're out of $4 and a cup of coffee. You have not met your needs. Uh, you've missed me with this sermon. Absolutely. Keep listening, though. Those are the people who like usually put their fingertips together and end on their toes whenever they say, us poppycock, I just, and they're British for some reason. But what if, what if I gave you what I wanted? Before first service, I went to pay for my actual cup of coffee. Again, plug for squad. I went to pay for my cup of coffee, and the cashier, lovely cashier, Cassidy, uh, she said, it's already been taken care of. Someone already paid for my coffee, to which I said, oh, wow, that." That's great. And I turned around and said, hey, what are you about to get? A cup of coffee. Hey, can I get Tyrone a cup of coffee? So I, I paid for his coffee. And he, he paid and he said, hey, uh, I want to pay for a coffee. To which she said, it's already been taken care of. So there's probably like a long list of unpaid. I don't know. They're probably all types of confused back there trying to figure out the, the payment. But he paid for someone else's coffee. So here's my third question. What if what we wanted as individuals was the same thing. What if what you wanted and what I wanted were actually the same thing? And I argue that they are. I'll try to say this slowly so that you can write it down. We are all individuals with individual needs who can meet each other's individual needs. Let me go back to my... This tends to help with, you know, Presenters say that this works if you move across the stage. I don't know. We are all individuals with individual needs who can meet each other's individual needs. I just had to throw off the camera people. They can't sleep during the, they can't tweet anything when I preach. They really hate it when I preach, but we love them. But we're all individuals who have the same needs. Whenever... I wanted something, I gave it away, and somehow coffee found me. Whenever I I want a compliment, what would happen if I started by complimenting someone else? What if, if you can imagine in your mind the, the word individual, what if the first I complimented the second I, even though they don't quite see eye to eye on a topic, and the third I witnessed it? Do we not have all three eyes agreeing? All in favor say, right. yeah. You got to work it. You got to work it. Now, to illustrate this point, I need a little assistance. Uh, there's a craze that has taken over the world. It's really an epidemic. And I know that you know what it, whenever I, I say it. But have you heard of a fidget spinner? Oh, yeah. As a teacher, you know that there is a devil because there's a fidget spinner. So, you know, gone is the water, ball, uh, water bottle flipping. Now we have the, the spinner. The, the funny thing about the spinner is that it's allegedly supposed to help you if you're addicted to your cell phone because now that's in your hands so you're away from it. Uh, but also, it seems as though, uh, for some reason, uh, it can help with your ADD. And for me, it seems that it just gives me something else to focus on. So if you have a fidget spinner, could you hold it up real quick? Just hold it up. Like everyone in the room, if you have a fidget spinner, just hang, hold it up. Let's see how many fidget spinners we have. I want to see how many fidget spinners we have. We have a couple, absolutely. Uh, Robert, can you bring me up a fidget spinner? That's great. So I don't have one because <laughs> I'm a t- teacher and we're trying to, you know, abolish them. I'm just kidding. They're, they're really cool. Thank you. And I, I promise I won't mess this up, hopefully. But this is a fidget spinner if you're, if you're not familiar with it. And this one has three prongs on it. You can make them differently and get them differently. You can, like, pop out the gears. But the way it works is that there's a bearing in the middle here. And so with a little bit of momentum, it just tends to take over and all of a sudden it can like keep going and going with a little effort. Uh, so, so here's my point. I believe that there are three things, three individual needs that we all have. And I want to talk about those real quick because Jesus talked about them. And the first one, as you can imagine, would be love. So love, I think that we all need love, right? If you don't have love and you're on an island by yourself, you tend to befriend a volleyball. And that's just weird. So we need love, and we'll find it in volleyballs or inanimate objects, whatever the case may be. So we need love. If you're in a relationship and you don't have love, you're seeking love, and so you break up, hopefully, all right? And so you, you, you break up. You need love. You want love. I'd also say, uh, so we need to love each other. I would also say that we need to 
respect each other. Because I may not agree with everything that you do. And I may not agree with everything that you say. And we may have a lot of things in common, but with that, I can't agree. But I don't need to disrespect you. So if you're here today or you're watching online and you're not a Christian believer, you don't uh, know the whole Jesus thing, you're not sure about it, I'm sorry if someone has disrespected your opinion. I'm sorry that if someone has uh, brought up the whatever fact that you gave and then embarrassed you in front of everyone on why that couldn't be true or why that might not be true or why that claim doesn't work or hold water. I'm sorry for that. That's not what they should have done. Because I tell my students this the first day of class. You are one decision away from having the same perspective as someone else. You may not see eye to eye now. You may not agree with someone, and they could say the most outlandish thing. And you could say, oh, my word, I can't believe that they would ever believe that. Whether it's uh, political, whether it's racial, whether it's ethnical, whether it's whatever country, whatever the case may be, you are one decision away from having the same perspective. And it's just because you had different opportunities growing up, with a different house, with different rules. They got to be home at 1 a.m., you had to be home by 9 p.m., right? Different perspective, different rules. But you're one decision away from having the same perspective. So I can't disrespect your opinion because if I grew up with you, we'd probably share the same opinion. So I need love and I need respect, right? I need respect. The other one I need is I need honor. We should honor each other. We should, we should lift each other up. We should, we should help each other. I can't ridicule you. I should, I should honor you. I don't have to agree with everything. I don't have to compromise my beliefs to show compassion. But I should honor you. And so here, here's our fidget spinner. And with love, I should show that I love you. With respect, I should respect you. And, and here's how respect works. You've heard this before. You can help me fill in the blank. To get respect, you have to give respect. Notice how we always put the you in there. We don't say I. We don't say, well, to get respect, I have to give respect. No, no, no. It's to get respect, you have to give respect. So let me paint this picture for you. Someone comes at you with an argument or a case or some sort of something that's happened, and they come at a decibel level that's a little bit higher than what you would have liked. So this decibel level of, let's say, a loud conversation has now disrespected you, to which you say, oh, I'm not going to give you respect because you did not give me respect. And I would argue to you that that is backwards. Here's why. You're the one who wants respect, correct? Yes. I'll answer for you. If you're the one who wants respect, yet you feel disrespected, then you need to give the respect so that you can get the respect. Here's my point. This this will be catchy. If you want to write this down, you can. Whenever you feel disrespected, don't stop at the diss. Don't stop at the loud voice. Don't stop at how they brought up whatever it was that you don't believe in. Don't stop at the diss on how they offended you. Get to the respect. And here's your homework assignment. Next time you feel disrespected, All you have to do is pour on the respect and listen to how the conversation changes. Listen to how they'll shift. They they might even back up a little bit and say, oh, I I didn't need to come in like that. And they'll start to feel bad. So don't stop at the diss. Get to the respect and pour it on. But don't get it back. Keep pouring it. And when it comes to the honor, don't dishonor anyone. You can't dishonor someone. Instead, you should lift them up. Make them feel proud. Make them feel good. Because I know one thing that we like to do is some people will say this. I'm going to label you by your past and say that's all you will ever be. I'm going to label you by who you are and say that's all you're ever going to grow up to be. And that's going to be your future. So you are your past. And I would say, no, that is not true. You are not your past. This church will not call you by your past. This church will love you in spite of whatever it is that's in your past. Because I know that I'm a person who would love to forget his past, but I can use my past to give me a better future. I can use whatever it was that's been done to me and say that there's a God who did something for me. I can say that he rose for me just like he rose for you, and I'm not going to let my past stop me from my future. So, I cannot dishonor you. I cannot disrespect you. I need to love you. But as I give respect with with minimal effort, as I give respect, 
love comes at me. As I give honor, little effort, the bearing inside just starts going and going, and now all of a sudden, love comes at me. As I give love, respect comes at me, honor comes at me, love's coming back at me. If I really want it, I have to give it. If I really want it back, I have to give it first. Here's how you can, if, for all my Christians who said, is that biblical? Here's how it's biblical. Why do you love God? Why do you love Jesus? And I'll tell you, John three sixteen. Because God so loved the world. He loved you first. God got this before anybody. He said, if they're going to love each other, if they're going to love me, I've got to love them first and be the example. So if I give a little bit of effort in love, then love will come back to me. If you give a little bit of respect, respect will come back to you. If you give a little bit of honor, honor will come back to you. And then without any effort, it will take off and keep going and going and coming back and coming back. It's a profound thing, not the fidget spinner, but love. It's, it's pretty profound. And if the praise team can come on back up, I'll wrap this up. It's amazing to me how we want to stop at disrespect and dishonor and the pain and the, and the suffering and, and everything that we felt and not give what we want ultimately. Here's, here's what I mean by that. How can I love God for what he's done to me? what he's done for me, and not give that to someone else? How can I serve a God who did what I do not deserve and then turn around and say, you don't deserve it from me? And so the thing that gets me about this Sermon on the Mount is that one of the last things Jesus says, it is the last thing in chapter 5, he says, love your enemies. Those who don't look like you, those who don't sound like you, those who don't believe the same things you believe, those who ridicule you for what you do believe, those guys, love them. Pray for them. And the thing that I don't understand, or that was funny to me, I should say, is that it's the last thing he says here, but this sermon is from the beginning of his ministry. Now, that was like his first sermon. My first sermon was terrible. I'm sure of it. We probably had some people backslide. They just didn't know anything else after that first sermon. But Jesus' first sermon, pretty good. But it's what he did at the end of his ministry. Three years later, he would have his disciples in a room and they just did the Last Supper and now they're all arguing about who's better, who's going to be like beside Jesus, who's going to be at the right hand, who's number one, who's number two. They're trying to run down this list of who's better. And Jesus in John chapter 13, the verse 34, if you want to reference that, he said, a new command I give you. He's hearing all this and he says, you know what? We got we to go back to the mount. Y'all forgotten something. A new command I give you, love one another. Love one another. So I can't argue with you. My least favorite thing in school is whenever there's a fight, what could you possibly have to fight about? How does war break out at the dinner table? How does war break out in your family? How do we get to this point? Again, no one wakes up saying, I want to be bad today. But how can we have this confrontation? How can war break out if we're loving each other? And Jesus continues and says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So that's why I told you to write this down, that we show who Jesus is to us when we show love to everyone. Because that's how they can set us apart. And when we're set apart, we can change the world. When we go into our workplace and we act different because we know love and we're going to share love to you, whether I disagree or agree with you or not, whether I think that you're right or wrong, good or bad, whatever the case may be, I know that I wasn't worthy of his love, so I'm still going to give you his love through me. So I can still love you as Jesus has loved me. I'm just asking you to do what Jesus did. Love one another. And he goes on and says... And the last part of that, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, the biblical scholar in the room goes, I got you, preacher. He's talking to disciples. So that doesn't mean I need to go out into the world, into my workplace, into my family, to people who don't believe and hit them with all this Jesus stuff. 
I would say that you're almost correct. You do not need to confront your boss who is ridiculing you of doing a poor job because you might have been a little lazy and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and lay hands on them. That would be weird. And you just insulted them, no love. But you'll say, well, well, Josh, how I, I think it's a little petty that maybe an insult or something like that of me trying to do a biblical debate with someone could push them away from church. I think, the, I think Satan's just using that. That's just a little petty thing to keep them out of church. Okay. And I think it's also a little messed up that Satan could use you to do it. I, I think that we should never be used to keep anyone out of church. I'm just going back through and hitting those quotes I told you to write down. You already have this. We shouldn't be used to keep people out of church. Instead, we should give the love, we should give the respect, we should give the honor. And if I give one and I don't give all, I've got nothing. If I give respect, but don't give love, nothing happens. If I give honor, but then talk about you behind your back, no respect, no love. If I give love, and I give respect, and I give honor, then this thing can keep going and going and going, and it will come back around to me. All because there's a God in heaven who did it to me first. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't worth it, in my opinion, but he did it. And so to the Bible scholar, let me come back and touch on that. He did say all the disciples. That's how people know that you're the disciple, because you're in the room. But in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. So he's saying, yeah, that's how they're going to know that you're a disciple because you love each other. But you need to make disciples of all nations. Those who don't look like you. Those who don't talk like you. Those who don't want to even sound like you because of the way you carry yourself. Those who are from a different country, from a different background. They don't have the same clothes you do. They don't have the same job you do. They don't even smell like you do. They can't talk like you. They're on a different IQ level than you. You should make disciples of all nations because how you love other people is how you love God. And you love God because he loved you first. And you want it back. 